morning, everyone, and welcome. Yep. We're delighted to see everyone here today. And I thought I'd just take a moment and share a little bit about Alliance. I know that we have some newcomers. And so those of you who have been with us before, this may be a little bit of a rinse and repeat, but for those that are new, uh, we hope this will help you. So we're here really setting out to advance the health and wellness for those in need. And when we think about wellness, I really want to take a moment and share that we have for ourselves redefined. And for us, it's about complete physical, mental, spiritual, economic, and social well-being. So you'll see that that's, there's, a, there's a lot there. A little bit about our history. Um, we are pioneers ourselves in that we created the first PPO, or Preferred Provider Organization, in the United States. And that gave rise to a bolus of capital that once we sold, that created this endowment. And in terms of our history and a little bit about us, we've paid out about $100 million since our inception. So it just sort of gives you a little size and shape. Um, and when we think about our current portfolio and how we're um, considering how to use our dollars in the most wise and effective ways, we think about innovation. And, and, and this is really based on the thesis that we cannot spend more money to get the outcomes we need. If you think about the cost of health care in the United States, it's just eating up our economy. And we, we need to innovate and find new ways. We'll talk a lot about that. And you'll hear from a lot of people who have been with us on this journey for now. This is our ninth year. Um, additionally, we have a theme on our investments that we think coordination is better. So to the degree that we can open up through coordination additional access, reduce cost, improve quality. Uh, these are things you're going to hear repeated with the various innovations that we've invested in. And then also um, very important is trusting people. That means individuals in need, and that means also people that are closest to the issues. So you'll hear that as well. So we've got five funding programs. Uh, today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about our innovation initiative. But we also have an Invest Up program where we're really uh, strategically looking for opportunities to hack the status quo and meaningfully transform the health and wellness for those in need in our region. Additionally, we have our program-related investment. Some of you may have seen that the Access Youth Academy, we just did a deal with Mission Driven Finance, unlocking a $12 million capital project. So we are involved in not just granting dollars, but also investing where that makes sense. Um, and mission support, many of you know that we give core operating grants to great nonprofits trying to advance the current paradigm. We understand that while we're looking for the future, we also need to take care of the present. So we balance our portfolio as well. And then we, we, we aim to be responsive. There are opportunities that don't fit exactly in one of our buckets, and we aim to um, respond to specific needs. So with that, um, you'll see around there, um, both sides, poster boards of our I2 prior uh, winners. Many of those leaders are here today. You'll hear from them during our panels. But also, I invite you to stop by and visit with them as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'll just also mention that there's a text for babies analysis, a retrospective. We've got two posters, and we've got our impact team here. They'd be happy to visit with you about that as well. We're starting to analyze our portfolio more. And you know, really our evolution at this moment is you know, we've done a lot of things to get to this point, and many of you have been our partners. And we're inspired to even develop more positive impact. And so you'll see us pushing the envelope. And with that, um, I also just want to mention that we, for the first time this year, expanded our portfolio to allow others, other investors who believe like we do in innovation and investing in the future, that they could also participate with us. So we opened a couple of funds at the San Diego Foundation. You'll hear more about that uh, over the course of time. And with this, now I'd like to turn it to you. 
So we've got a couple of questions we want to ask as we move through this morning. And we're going to first start by asking everybody to do this thing called take out your phone. Mm -hmm. And um, you will want to text 222333. So two twos and three threes. And then you want to include in the body Alliance HF251. Alliance HF251. Everybody got that? No. <laughs> I'll give you a minute. So you want to put in the two. OK. It's not case, set, not case set sensitive. Thanks. OK, so just to sort of get a sense of who's in the audience, if you could just text back your letter based on your sector. See who's represented here. We'll give this a minute. I know there's an academic here, so the question is, did he figure out how to do the text? I won't say anything who it is, but so far it's zero. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Okay, the academics are losing. Oh no, they're there, oh there we are. Oh, foundations, come on people, don't we have some foundation people here like staff? Uh, somebody needs to get my phone. We've got some foundations here, I know. Whoa, okay. So does anybody know about that? Okay, well, uh, David, anything to do about that or are we just moving on? So I guess we're just so, so many people. OK, poll is full and no longer accepting. OK, so then you got to be fast. Interesting. OK, so it's a race. All right, so um, just this is just to get a sense of what you're thinking about in terms of if you are producing an I-2 application. And maybe let's leave it for those that are actually doing that today so that we're not going to clog up the, the polls. Okay, well, health and wellness, that's a safe bet, for sure. Okay. And, um, yeah, just a little bit about the population. Okay, well, we've got a good cross-section. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so now, uh, and for those that want to do the social media stuff, here's the information, hashtag I2 funding. I'll give you a moment. All right. Except for the clicker doesn't, there we go. So it is my pleasure actually to introduce our interim board chair for the Alliance Healthcare Foundation. And actually, Dr. Ramsdell was a member of the Alliance Healthcare for Foundation board at inception. So he's actually been around a long time and uh, can, can set us straight on history. So he's also a distinguished professor and division head of general internal medicine emeritus at the University of California, at San Diego. In addition to his personal practice as a general internist, Dr. Ramsdell has had an ongoing research interest in general internal medicine, pulmonary disease, chronic disease management, and healthcare delivery. During his tenure as division head, he built the Division of General Internal Medicine at UC San Diego that now includes over 120 general internists at the University of California, San Diego, and San Diego's Veterans Administration Health Services System. These faculty members are involved in cutting edge health, services research, as well as personal care, and importantly, teaching. Thank you. Please join me in welcome. Well, unfortunately, none of them taught me how to, are we tweeting? Is that what we're doing? So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out whether I'm nonprofit or foundation or academic, so bear with me. <laughs> um, I, I, I promised Elizabeth that I would take less than my allotted three minutes to make up for our technical gaffes. So what I'd like to do is, is look at this through the eyes of people who might be thinking about applying for an innovation initiative. And you're going to hear a lot this morning from those that, that made it. Uh, 
you're going to hear their joys and perhaps their frustrations in receiving this uh, prestigious award. But the important thing is to think about how it would fit with the goals of your institution. Now, the ultimate goal of this whole process is to bring innovation to bear on underprivileged, underserved residents of San Diego and Imperial Valley. And when we talk about innovation, we're not just talking about technology, and this is very important. Clearly, technology is a powerful tool, but innovation also has to do with the way we deal with each other, with the way we deal with our communities, and innovative approaches that have to do with interpersonal skills, systems, that, and so on and so far, they're just as important as using technology. So don't get in a box with thinking about what you mean by innovation. What are we looking for in terms of the types of applications? Well, we want home runs. Our goals are to have something that is really going to move the needle in one way or another in terms of the lives of people, in terms of the value of care or of, of the, the services are provided, and in terms of the impact it has on the communities that we care about. We look at these, these parameters in several different ways. Clearly, social, economic are important. Health is important. But when you're putting your application together, don't forget the human impact, the human touch. Practical advice. This is a process. This is not a standard grant. This isn't like writing an NIH or a, or a foundation grant in the usual way. This is a competition. Work with staff early in terms of whether it's a generally good idea and what's going to be involved. Staff will help you in terms of developing your pitch. The other thing about our process is we don't tend to fire and forget. Ask questions from our past uh, grantees, but we like to stay involved and we like to help solve problems. And so this is really a partnership that we're looking forward uh, to going, uh, going through achieving the goals. And I think I've, I've made, delivered my message in under my allo allocated time, Elizabeth, so now you're going have to have to kill a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Okay, now it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce Nick Mashiam. Over the last 30 years, Nick Maschion has been a leader in the fields of health, housing, and human services. Since 2008, Nick has served as director of the Health and Human Services Agency of the County of San Diego. The Health and Service Agency is one of the nation's largest local integrated delivery systems for health, housing, and human services. In this role, Nick oversees a workforce of approximately 6,400 employees. 6,000 contracted employees and a $2.2 billion annual budget, which, which serves 1.3 million people. Since becoming director, Nick has been at the forefront of a paradigm shift, transforming how government serves the public to live well. More specifically, Nick is the architect and key strategist for a large-scale social movement for prevention wellness and whole person care called Live Well San Diego, of which Alliance Healthcare Foundation is a proud partner. It is a vision for all San Diego County residents to be healthy, safe, and thrive. Since its inception in 2010, Nick has partnered with hundreds of diverse governments, schools, businesses, and community-based organizations to collectively unify a region where everyone can live well. It translates to connecting the unconnected while reducing medical costs and improving the customer experience and leveraging community partners. We all know him as a wellness warrior, leading with passion and purpose. Please join me in welcoming Nick. Good morning. Thank you for using your younger picture for me. Um, what a great audience for an amazing and extremely important purpose. Um, Elizabeth was way too kind with her remarks. I am just a, um, a spoke in the hub that we all are. And, and the reality is in San Diego, we are leading, with all truth here, 
the movement from sick care to health care to health to wellness. And this idea about wellness, which we're going to hear about, is that we need to innovate to achieve wellness for all. So I was, I was, I was listening to Dr. Ramsell and, and, and uh, Elizabeth. Five things came to mind in terms of um, what we're doing with our, our social movement for wellness for all 3.4 million San Diegans. And it's the five eyes for impact. And the first one I thought about was that we inspire. We have to inspire one another in our work that we have to do every day, be it in government, be it in non-profit, for-profit, philanthropy, faith-based, Jackie Y. Robinson, all the different entities. We have to inspire one another and we have to inspire to then inform the second I. We need to inform what is happening in our community. Whether it's chronic disease, whether it's helping asylum-seeking families coming to our border and helping families in need, inform. The third then is to include and integrate, and this is extremely important. We will not succeed if we stay in that friendly co-opetition, collaborate, compete mode. We will always compete, but we have to move from this collaborative state to an integrative state, and you'll see why in a moment. The fourth I is the wonderful, amazing alliance and to the board and to the staff, invest up. We need to invest up, not just with what Alliance is doing and the Health and Human Services, but all of us in this community. How are we investing up? How are we harmonizing our investment up? And then the, five, the fifth I, impact. You see, in Livewell San Diego, the two most important metrics that count, and if you're not talking to me about these two, I don't want to hear about the rest. If you're not telling me how you're improving life expectancy and quality of life for all San Diegans, the rest of it stops there for me. Yes, we are after extending years of life and quality of life, right? Happier and longer, not shorter and grumpier, right? So we are writing that sequel to the IOM, Institute of Medicine at that time that they were called, report. Shorter lives, poorer health. We're, we, Alliance Healthcare Foundation, everyone in this room, in our community is writing the sequel, which is Longer Lives, Better Health. And that sequel is going to be with those five eyes around innovation. And it's going to be because we have to collaborate and find this movement from collaborative to integrative state. Because this movement's underfoot in San Diego. For those of you that's not a Live Well partner, talk to me on the side. There is no exchange of money, by the way. As Elizabeth pointed out, we are partners celebrating whether it's around health, safety, or thriving, whether it's about economic inclusiveness or helping someone access to important health or dealing with trauma-informed. It's all of the above that defines wellness. That's why we don't talk about health reform or social service reform in San Diego. We talk about wellness having every San Diego live with wellness. And to end is, what's exciting to me is this kind of cross-sectoral approach now. So I challenge all of those that are, all of you that are thinking about going to the space about, how are you going to move outside your comfort zone? How are you going to be multi-sectorial? Because the social determinants, we've been doing that for the last 20 years. It's like people have found fire in the last five years with the social determinants. In San Diego, we've been doing it. But what does doing it mean? It means we've been embracing and the importance of where health and safety meet and housing. The importance of how we are achieving this movement of live well for all San Diegans. And that's why the Health and Human Service Agency, the County of San Diego, as a government, it's extraordinarily proud to be a partner with the Alliance Healthcare Foundation and someone of an organization I've known for 22 years as a board members. And how we're co-investing, co-creating with not just our two entities, but all of you. The great Irish philosopher Bono from U2 <laughs> said the, the simplest impact, the simplest impact, with greatest impact, the simplest idea 
It's connecting with people. So to Dr. Ramsdell's point about, let's not forget about the person-centered design as we think about the population-centered design. Enjoy this morning. You have phenomenal folks here. Make sure you network, learn, and remember the five eyes. Thank you. Okay, and now for our keynote. So it is my pleasure to introduce Robin Farman Farmian. So Robin is a social entrepreneur and angel investor based in Silicon Valley. She focuses on companies working on cutting edge technology in healthcare, early stage pharma, med device, and digital health. She is highly influential in Singularity University. I actually, Robin and I um, shared an exponential medicine conference uh, at the NASA facility, which um, did not win any awards for comfort, I will say, but for brilliance, for sure. Um, just in case anybody wants to know, those accommodations that they put those NASA people through were um, less than wonderful. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we had a great time. Um, so she's an adjunct uh, faculty member at Singularity University. Uh, she's a conference board advisor and the founding executive producer of the university's Exponential Medicine Program. In addition to publishing numerous articles in Wired Forbes and the Huffington Post, Robin is the author of books, The Thought Leader Formula and The Patient as CEO, How, health how Technology Empowers the Healthcare Consumer, which is an Amazon bestseller. Please join me in welcoming Robin. Thank you, thank you. All right, so hi everyone. You heard I am Robin Farman Farmian. Now, my life goal, are we, does this not work? There we go. So my life goal is to positively impact a minimum of 100 million patients worldwide. As an early stage entrepreneur and angel investor, I now work in things like deep pharma and med device. One's a company curing cancer by repairing P53. We're an early stage small molecule. We also have a small molecule for autoimmune disease. One of my recent investments included inhaled insulin with a liquid formulary and a smart connected device. And I'm on an advisor on a unicorn called Mind Maze, which is a virtual reality for stroke and brain injury rehabilitation. So these are pretty crazy things, right? I'm working in diabetes and neuro and cancer all at once. You know when you meet someone as crazy as I am, there's a backstory, right? So with me, at the age of 16, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease. All told, I have had 43 hospitalizations and six major surgeries. Now, when you're facing surgery, and especially when you're a kid, right, you go from hospital system to hospital system looking for the very best doctors out there. None of my doctors ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin, let's hold off on these surgeries because you're so young and technology is moving so quickly. It could provide better solutions in the near future. None of my doctors ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin, technology is hope. But technology is hope. In fact, had digital health IT and just the sheer amount of information we now have access to as patients existed back when I was a teenager, I might not have lost three organs. Now at the age of 26, this was seven years after they had taken out my entire large intestine, my doctors were telling me I was cured. <laughs> but I wasn't, and I was in extreme pain. So over a period of time, they kept upping and upping my opiate dose until eventually I was on 80 milligrams a day of methadone. Let me tell you, this is a gigantic dose of opiates and I hated the drug. So I went back to my doctor and I said, I need off this medication now. They said, okay, well, next step to be, could be to surgically implant a morphine pump into your spine. I was like, are you kidding me? I was 26 years old. I was essentially a shut-in. I was so sick, I couldn't function in life. And they were telling me that was the rest of my life. So I said, absolutely not. And I fired my entire healthcare team. And I rebuilt it with healthcare professionals that worked with me as a team and a colleague. I ended up getting diagnosed correctly, put on a medication called Remicade. And within 24 hours of that first dose, I went into remission. It was overnight. 
So that is why I do what I do, and that is also why I became a speaker, so that I can help empower other people to take control of their health. So let's switch into talking about some of the trends going on in the innovation in healthcare delivery, because I think this is really one of the most important parts of healthcare is actually getting it to the patient. So some quick stats, expected to be a $41 billion industry over the next couple of years in the world of telemedicine. And companies like American Well, there we go, they just did a $365 million raise last year, bringing their total funding to date to over $570 million. In this last fundraising round, Philips and Samsung. Think about that for a second, right? They understand that the goal is not just to be telemedicine for American Well, but really to be that connector technology between payers, providers, employers, and consumer-facing technology. And CMS. Last year, they unbundled one code for patient remote monitoring, which allowed physicians to get about $720 back a year reimbursed for you know, remote monitoring of their patients. This year, they now have three brand new codes. It's all around setting up remote monitoring for the patient, educating that patient, and then actually doing the remote monitoring, and then a third code for any type of communication that happens because of the remote monitoring. And some other cool trends. CVS is hoping to launch, they should have done it by now, uh, nationwide $59 telemedicine visits that they are setting up so that it can be reimbursed by insurance. This is a really cool one. The VA, as of last year, the state boundaries came down for doctors. What this means, if you are a doctor and you are licensed only in the state of California, it no longer matters where your patient is located. This is a really big deal. Kaiser Permanente, as of 2017, more than 50% of all of their clinic visits were done virtually. And point of care diagnostics, or what I like to call diagnostics on demand, we're seeing a wide array hit the clinical space, but our, I mean, sorry, the consumer space, but are actually clinical grade, which means your doctor can determine things based on the data. So stethoscopes or ear monitoring devices that just hook into your smartphone. With the ear monitoring, all you need to do is it records the child's ears for a couple of minutes. You can send that to a physician and avoid going to the emergency room at two in the morning. Things like uh, single lead EKG monitors, we all know that those are now on the market. AliveCore was first to market, but Apple already has one, and Verily just got clearance for theirs. And Philips Lumify, now this is really cool. It is actually an ultrasound machine that plugs into your smartphone and is on a subscription model for $200 a month. Imagine deploying somebody into low income areas that has these tools. You can outfit a healthcare professional for under $1,000. Omron just got clearance for their blood pressure monitoring watch. I think it was like four days ago, maybe five days ago. $500. Shipping and handling is free, though. You know. <laughs> and Science37, they have done about $72 million of funding. And what it is is sightless clinical trials. This is really cool, because uh, imagine you're a pharmaceutical company. Well, you have to have clinical trial sites, and once you choose those sites in specific geographic locations, you are limited to the patient pool around those locations. But if you do a sightless clinical trial, you now have a patient pool that is the size of the country or the world. Science 37 will package up the medication, even if it requires refrigeration and we'll ship it to the patients. So you don't have to have them come into a specific center. And this is really cool for patients because if you think about it, if you get cancer and you do like the standard of care chemotherapy or you get yourself into a clinical trial, either way, it's really still part of that healthcare journey for that patient, right? And this is me. This is my apartment. I get the vast majority of my healthcare in my apartment or within a two block radius. This year, I did my flu shot. It took under five minutes, $0 copay. I did it through Heal. They came to my apartment, a doctor and a nurse. Five minutes later, they were gone. It was the easiest flu shot I have ever gotten. I get my blood draws done in my home. And this is me getting Remicade. Now, I've been on this medication for 19 years. Nobody try and do the math. <laughs> First 16 years, I went to high-end hospitals, Stanford, UCSF. Let me tell you, I'd go and the 
The experience was horrific. It would be, you know, 10 other patients in that room, constant beeping with IV poles, televisions blaring, zero windows. And of course, as an immunocompromised patient, I was surrounded by infectious disease. I'd go home and it would take me eight days to recover from this infusion, and I get it every six weeks. Well, three years ago, my insurance company dropped Stanford, nobody told me, and bam, I had a $50,000 bill for two Remicade treatments which was crazy. Fortunately, the insurance company did cover it retroactively, but that means I needed to learn how to hack my healthcare so I could afford my medication because that would bankrupt even a millionaire. So what I did is I found a full service pharmacy. What this means is that it's a pharmacy that makes all of their money on, um, on the cost of drugs. So they, you know, they add money to the cost of the drug and they deploy nurses into the field. So all it is is they have that small brick and mortar, they have pharmacists, they have administrative staff, and they have nurses, which means that they can dramatically reduce the cost, especially over something like an academic medical center like Stanford and AMC, who has incredibly huge costs. So my Remicade treatment went from $25,000 billed to my insurance company to $2,500. Same drug, same thing, but not only this, and, and uh, I do a lot of talks for pharmaceutical companies, and their mouths drop open at this next statement. My recovery time, just by changing the patient experience, went from eight days to four. Massive difference. Now, last year, I also hospitalized myself at home for three days. Now, I have Crohn's disease and no large intestine, which means if I get a food poisoning or a GI flu, what would be an uncomfortable few days for a normal person is life-threatening for me within 12 hours. So I got something like that, and 12 hours later, I wake up in my bed, and I'm like, I need to call an ambulance to go to the emergency room or get somebody here. And I don't want to go to the emergency room just to get IV hydration. That's all I needed was magnesium and IV hydration. It's ridiculous to go to the emergency room for that. So I hacked it. I used two different consumer-facing IV on-demand companies. One's called IV Doc, and one is called Vital Solutions. I texted my friend at Vital Solutions, and I went on the app for IV Doc. Within an hour, I had a nurse in my bedroom giving me two liters of IV saline. I did that for three days. I just alternated between those two companies, called my full-service pharmacy that my insurance company would actually cover. And out of pocket, I think for those three days, I spent about $2,000, which included bringing in my in-home masseuse while I was in my hospital, right? Which you can't do when you're in the emergency room or being hospitalized. So for under $2,000, I was able to have a three-day a three hospitalization. Had I gone in through an ambulance to the emergency room to be hospitalized, I think that bill might have been a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> All right, so let's switch on over for the last few minutes into talking about nonprofits and for-profits and scaling. Because at this point, I've worked with about 25 companies. A third of them have been in the nonprofit space. The rest are in the for-profit space. So I have a lot of perspective on this. Now, when I first got started working, I went to the nonprofit world. I was like, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to change the world. I want to help people. I'm going into nonprofits. And then when I need to make a little bit of money to you know, pay my rent in Silicon Valley, I'll, uh, I'll you know, work in some of the for-profits. And while that might have been true when some of us entered our careers, it's no longer true. It's not impact versus profit. It's now the fact that you are doing something that's impactful is a given, right? It doesn't matter what your tax status is. So, now, when I think about starting new companies or I come on board, typically I come on board as one of the first 10 employees or, or advisors at the company, I ask myself four different questions when I'm talking, thinking about scale because now everything I want to do, I want it to scale to it hit 100 million patients worldwide. So first question I ask myself is, what's the revenue model? Right? Where am I going to start bringing in money? Right? Second question, what are the funding sources and exactly how much money do I need to make an impact? Actavel, the, the company I mentioned, we want to cure more than 50% of all cancer. This is a really big deal. We will impact millions and millions of people all over the world. First six and a half million dollars of our funding was grant money. That's a lot of money, right? Six and a half million dollars, most of us would take that. But when you're talking about early stage pharmaceutical, it's going to cost us 
hundreds of millions of dollars just to get to human trials, and that does not even count commercializing it, right? We need to be a for-profit. Same thing with the inhaled insulin. We are going to make a massive impact because we can dramatically undercut the cost of injected insulin. So we can hit a lot of people who are low income, but again, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to get that to market. So we have to be a for-profit. So the fourth question is that I ask myself, is this a community driven? Can I do this with a community? And that is one of the, my favorite ways to start a nonprofit is it, what you do is you build up the community and you empower them, you enable them, you catalyze this community to solve that problem for you. The community gets their own funding and uses their own labor. Now I've done this with a nonprofit I co-founded about six years ago called the Organ Preservation Alliance. And what we did is uh, we were biotech and we catalyzed breakthroughs in cryopreservation in order to eradicate the world's transplant shortage. We were envisioning having a bank of organs that we can freeze. Now, when, um, when we went out and did this, what we did is we went to all the white papers on all the cryobiologists in the world and we found them and we reached out to them and we brought them to the United States for a bunch of different conferences where they sat down together and they mapped out a successful roadmap to successful cryopreservation. In fact, by aggregating all of these cryobiologists, we were able to get it down to a six stage engineering process where no individual stage had to be more than 90% complete for cryopreservation to work for transplants. Then we took it one step further. We went to the Department of Defense in DARPA and the White House, and uh, in the, inside the White House we had all the acronyms in there, you know, OSTP, the FDA, the HHS, the NIH. And we educated all those people in power and in power of the grant money on what was going on in the world of cryopreservation and that we were able to think about it being a 35 year out problem to be solved. That's what people had estimated 10 years ago that, oh, well, cryopreservation would be solved in about 35 years. We got it down to eight. We expect this problem to be solved in the next eight years. And so then we did the workshop at the Department of Defense and DARPA. And what they want is, of course, the military wants their own organ bank for their military men, obviously. So what they did is they wrote six different grants around those six stages that our community had come up with and funded it to the tune of $15 million, which means now all those academic researchers and some of the startups that were in there have access to grant money coming out of the DOD and support coming out of the DOD because we created this community, right? Now, in addition, we were able to uh, start with tissue engineering as well. So we were starting to bring in a lot of the tissue engineers, which was really cool. But it's a great way to solve a problem by catalyzing that community. And the way we scale is we scale through the startups and through the academic researchers. Now, the last part of this story is we did this all in about 250, maybe $350,000 in the first few years. And all of that funding came from a venture capitalist and his foundation. Now, not only was he very excited to see this problem be solved, but he had portfolio companies working on cryopreservation. So anything that we could do to really increase this industry would help his bottom line in the end, right? So you can kind of see that circle. So I wanna leave you with a call to action. Start to rethink what's possible. Had I just thought about, well, maybe I need to go to Palo Alto Medical Foundation and get my Remicade instead of you know, bringing it into the home. Instead, I rethought it and I thought, how can I hack this? How can I do it in a way that makes it more affordable for me, more affordable for my insurance company? And it had that amazing effect of being able to dramatically reduce the recovery time. So what is possible out there? Reimagine and hack everything. Thank you. OK, panel one. Um, so I'll, I'll actually call up first uh, Renato, executive director of Access Youth Academy. And I'd like to have Ahmed Saeed, president and CEO of Somali Family Services. You could join me on stage. So we've got two of our I2 winners with us. And now I'd like to also call up to the stage Dr. Joe Ramsdell from our board, Dr. Rodney Hood, and Dwight Smith. If you could all join me. All right. Hi. You can... uh, my name is Renato Paiva. I, uh, I run Access Youth Academy here in San Diego for the past uh, going 13 years now and we were lucky enough to be an uh, I2 uh, award uh, a few years ago to uh, 
work on our project on building our new facility. Um, it's actually two blocks down the road from here. So uh, if you came from the 94, you maybe see an open lot before Walgreens. And that project is coming to fruition um, this next summer. We break ground. We help low-income students um, through 12-year program from the seventh grade to two years post-college using education and the very well-famous sport of squash. Not the vegetable, but the sport of squash. So um, we do that, and we're doing that successfully. We have 100% graduation rate, and we've uh, yielded $6.3 million in scholarships thus far. Thank you. Ahmed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed Saheed. I'm with Somali Family Service. Uh, we are one of the I2 winners, and uh, we're very uh, glad to be part of the partnership. Uh, our project is really focusing on increasing uh, immunization rate and pediatric health. Uh, we're in City Heights. We work with the refugee population, a population that have very low uh, health literacy, uh, that has uh, many health you know, issues and conditions. And one of those is uh, the immunization rate, which is you know, 42%. Uh, general public is about 90%. So our goal is to increase the immunization rate uh, uh, in the refugee population. And in doing so, we are uh, engaging the community and also uh, utilizing uh, technology, in this case, you know, virtual reality, to uh, educate you know, the parents and caretakers uh, because our community is really responding to image-based learning. And so we're uh, actually at the forefront to incorporate our content and health education uh, using technology. Thank you. Now what I'd like to do is open it up to our panelists um, to have the board members articulate what was it about these innovations that we were looking at and thought that it made sense for us to make this investment. And I'll just start with Dwight. And Dwight, you can speak to one or both of them. Okay. Well, I'll speak to both. Uh what got my vote is I always look for a clearly identified barriers to accessing health care. So I don't believe in just build it and they will come. I believe you need to clearly identify what are the unique roadblocks to accessing health care. So it's not just physical barriers, but I think there are cultural barriers. Uh, there is uh, misinformation, mistrust. I believe a lot of uh, misinformation is just born out of mistrust. Um, also, I was attracted to uh, having a lived experience, having some community leaders who have actually the lived experience of the situation we're trying to resolve. So those are some key points I look for and why I voted for both of these projects. Thank you. Dr. Hood? Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I guess we all come from our own uh, perspective. And uh, I'm a uh, practicing uh, physician. I've been practicing not far from this area for 40 years. And so um, one of the things I learned about my uh, practice that I also apply to when I evaluate grants is, why do patients come to me? Uh, Rolf uh, Bernerska, who also had ulcerative uh, colitis, one time stated that what a patient cares about are three things. Uh, one is uh, quality. Uh, so when they go to the physician's office, uh, does this doctor know what he's doing? Is he qualified to treat me? And the other one is trust. Can I trust this physician? He is, I'm going to be sharing some personal information with him, and uh, can I trust him to kind of uh, take that information in a uh, professional way? And probably the last issue is, um, uh, does he care about me? What, what th does he truly care about me? What does he know about me? And how does that relate to grants? To me, uh, where it's not just innovation, but the population you're serving. Do you really understand the population that you're serving? Do you care about the population that you're serving? And I think that relates to, is it innovative? That's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and I think at the Alliance Healthcare Foundation, we have discussions all the time about what innovation is or is not. Um, and I don't think it's just technology. It's like taking something maybe that's been around a while, but are you implementing it at the ground community level? I think the other is collaboration. And I don't mean going out, signing up a clinic on a piece of paper saying that I'm collaborating with this. Are the entities really partnering together, okay? Do they really know what they're doing? 
And the other is uh, sustainability, okay? And I think that um, uh, healthcare foundations, like Alliance Healthcare Foundation, uh, what I like about it is that they realize that in the past, uh, just giving grants and then saying we want you to be sustainable, sustainability meant looking for money for the next grant. Well, we're really looking for after three, four, five years, how are you going to uh, continue that uh, sustainability? And I think uh, three of the, th these two um, grants, in my opinion, showed that. I must say on the end, there was a young lady that talked before the board that was very convincing <laughs> uh, of, about how effective your uh, program was. Thank you. Dr. Ramsdale? So I, I'll, I'll be fairly brief. The Academy uh, was able to tell a story that involved the major aspects that I think I outlined earlier in terms of impact rationale for it. But in the end, it was really the human touch, the human face that I think uh, persuaded the board more than anything. Ahmed's program addressed a very serious issue that is topical in terms of the uh, uh, the unreasonable bias against immunization. There he said it, so you know where I'm coming from, okay? And the impact it's having on a very specific underserved community in San Diego. So he, he took a strong case in terms of a topical need for an under, underrepresented, underserved community in San Diego and linked it with an innovative approach using simulation technology to explain to uh, his population in a culturally sensitive way why immunizations were not something to be feared but were something very important to achieve in the community. So in addition to, to uh, a broader human look in terms of how this affected his community, he, he was able to link both a knowledge of the, the needs, the cultural needs of this community with an exciting new technology. I'm going to take just a second to, to vamp a little bit on a word that Ahmed used, partnership. Both of my colleagues here will probably smile a little bit. But in the course of, after achieving both these grants, there was a lot of interaction around how we could achieve sustainability, or what I like to call institutionalization, which is the buzzword in, in our world. You know, when you get a grant from the NIH or HHS, uh, they're looking to institutionalize it so that the university takes it on and continues to fund it. Well, that's the mindset that our board has also. And in doing that, we will utilize the, and leverage the expertise of our board and of consultants to help overcome individual problems that come up as we try to realize a business plan. So I'll, I'll, I'll open the door for you guys to, to attack us on that a little bit later. Thank you, Joe. So Renato, can you maybe speak a little bit to the sort of structural innovation of why squash, you know, sort of why urban squash? What's the theory of change? Just to exposit that for the group. Yeah, um, the idea is that squash is a primary rich sport that's played on the most affluent places in this country. The movement started 25 years ago in Boston, and at that time I was coaching, uh, not 25 years, but uh, 12 years, 13 years ago I was coaching at Harvard, and I was uh, presented the opportunity to do this here in San Diego, to, to break the barriers of education through the sport of squash to take them to a better place. Um, it is an innovative way to do work. Um, everywhere I go, every single day of my life, I have to crack the joke about the squash and why and this. Squash in San Diego is beach volleyball in Alaska. It makes no sense why we're doing this. It actually makes a lot of sense. It's working really well. And uh, the, the ripple effects, Elizabeth, that we're having with this, our work and the trust, Dr. Hood just mentioned that, is unreal. Um, yesterday night, I got a phone call from one student saying, I need you, I need you now. I have need the major issues. So we deploy people, and those are very critical things that are gonna really make a difference in this student's life. Um, so we're very proud of the way we innovate it, and we are consistent. Small things every day for a long period of time. That's key to make it work. Renato, just a follow-up question on that. Um, the kids, as they get through and, and get these scholarships, what's the, the debt load after school? Sorry. What's the debt load? What are they stuck with afterwards? I mean, that's a big issue in our society right yeah, now. Yeah, we are very proud of um, the opportunity that this program in squash and education combined provides them. Um, 
as I said, we yield $6.3 million in scholarships, and uh, our students are going to UCSD, um, UCLA, but a bunch of the Ivy League schools, and luckily, by the combination of the great academics that we provide and the athletic portion, they are often uh, out with zero debt out of college, which is our goal. Um, Sometimes they have to work a little bit, which is okay. They got to work in school to, to pay some bills, um, but the, um, the, the debt is, is as close to zero as possible. Thank you. Ahmed, um, thinking about the program that you're developing, and, and maybe you could speak a little bit about the journey from your perspective as an I2 applicant to the point in which you're here sitting today. And maybe you could speak about it from your perspective, then I'll ask our board members to also reflect. So, Ahmed, would you do that? Well, first of all, I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that was very helpful, and I think uh, all the future applicants need to pay attention, is that the Lions Healthcare Foundation have both an incredible resources and support and mentoring uh, that was very, very helpful. And for us to put our application together, our presentation, the mentoring and the coaching and the presentation and the workshops really was very helpful. And I think that really was the roadmap of you know, our success. Second, I think a partnership uh, is, was a key. You know, as a nonprofit organization, it's oftentimes we talked about partnership, but true partnership is really to bring all the stakeholders together and discuss about your strategy, but also as Director Hood mentioned, you know, the sustainability. You know, for us as a nonprofit, oftentimes sustainability and scalability is another grant. In this case, we really have to think out of the box and think about, you know, social enterprise business model that go beyond the project in life. And so for us, we really have tackled that from the get-go when we were putting our project together. Third, I think it is, you know, oftentimes when we make, want to make an impact, we really have to enlist the beneficiary, the client who we're serving. For us, we have series of community meetings and focus groups that really identify the problem, and actually the solution came from the communities themselves. So that was really a very key component also, and I think through that process, we were very much ready uh, at the presentation. Thank you. And now I'd like to ask our trustees to weigh in sort of on the journey after the decision for these two applicants. We've talked a little bit about sort of the some of the rationale, but now it's sort of, we're on a road together. Dwight, you want to kick us off? Well, I, I again look at community building. Uh, I think the journey begins with the award, but then I look at how are we improving the anchors of our community, the jewels of our community. I believe it's already there. We just need to support what we have, utilize what we have in our communities. Uh, what I really enjoy is not only the physical structures that come about, but when we use our own community workers to solve our own problems. Uh, when we have community health workers that are going out, reaching our um, ill and sick, I think that serves two purposes. Not only do we have cultural competency, but we have the economic engine in these communities that will self-perpetuate and sustain the growth and the health and wellness in these communities. So that's what I like. Thank you. Dr. Hood? So um, to add to that, I think uh, one of the um, innovation things that the Alliance Healthcare Foundation does is once when you get the grant, we consider ourselves a partner. So in essence, we uh, do a lot of work to kind of bring resources, not just for us, but for you to, for you to continue to be uh, sustainable. I think uh, our great uh, chairman, it's a very diverse board. We have different concepts. And I heard Joe, our chairman, say we're looking for a home run. Um, and in my opinion, I'm looking for somebody that's able to make it home. So, so even if the uh, grant solidly says you're going to get the first or second, what we're looking for through the uh, partnership is that there's going to be enough support to eventually get you home. And uh, so I think there is a true partnership, not just with the uh, ones we're giving the grant, but their partners, as well as the Alliance Healthcare Foundation to get them home. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff. Rodney's the first base coach and I'm the third base coach. <laughs> Waving them home. So I think that, again, I'm gonna stress partnership and the uh, helpful piece of advice is to listen to what Ahmed said in particular, 
about getting involved with uh, foundation staff early in the journey of putting together your proposal. Uh, our, our application process is not ordinary. It's not crazy, but it's not ordinary. It involves different ways of communications than many of your grant writers may be used to. And it's important to start the thinking about that very early with some input from, from Elizabeth and, and our, our, our staff. I think the, the second point I want to make is, is the business of getting things home. And we will try to emphasize the importance of a business plan. This is a, a very business-oriented idea. We would like to take the concept that you believe in and make it sustainable or institutionalize it so it lasts forever. And that may, or at least what forever means in these, these times, but what that means is we're really looking for ways to develop alternate streams of, of finance for it, alternate ways from writing the next grant. So are there, are there patents that might be available? Are there other types of things that might be commercializable, if that's a word, uh, coming out of this that would provide the, your agency with what's needed? The final point I want to make is that through our, our program-based ba investing program, we can also help people who are now partners with us get over the next hump in terms of things that look like they are going to lead to a, an income stream but need a loan to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, as our speaker this morning pointed out, is a, a securing funds doesn't necessarily mean writing a grant. It may be writing a loan at an appropriate interest rate so that you can make it to the next step. So I'm going to continue on the baseball analogy, I guess, and I'm going to talk about the curveballs. Um, <laughs> because I'd like our, our um, panelists to speak about that, particularly our 2i2 grantees. And I think, you know, Renato, maybe start with you and then Ahmed. I think you've already experienced in your short journey some curveballs. So, um, Renato, why don't you talk about the, the journey you've been on? It's been long. I'll start this way. Um, we have a lot of uh, roadblocks along the way. Um, we are trying to break ground this summer, so it's been, um, I think, five years since we started this, pro this whole project. Um, it's still not done yet. We still have some steps to go. Um, I want to just um, um, talk about the, the idea of our project My um, my die, it happens every week, and the resilience and coming back and collaborating back uh, has been fantastic. Alliance, as Elizabeth said in the beginning, we just got a, um, a, a, a loan to get us home. And that, without this, we would we'll not we'll be here. And so, in the partnership and the continuing investment, it's key for us to get what we want to get. Um, so, I, I, I just want to make one point that you made earlier is that this grant, it was the most um, innovative way to get us to think how to say our message. So when we were trying to um, put our application forward, um, it was really interesting how we massage our story and how we made us better. And I was speaking to my board chair last night about out of our 17 dry runs for the presentation, uh, we changed a bunch of times. It just made us better. So if you're going through this process, I urge you to embrace the innovation and how you're going to say your, your piece. Thank you. Ahmed. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, what, I, what I learned in this process is that you have to be flexible. And uh, what that means is that what you present, you know, it might not be you know, the ultimate, you know, project or the design. And that is, you really have to be flexible in terms of be, continue to, you know, creative and innovative. And in our process, you know, uh, we really learned that, you know, there are certain things that we have to do before we really do the full launch of the project. And that is to understand either the market. Initially, our understanding was the problem is only for this community uh, that we're serving. In this case, the immunization rate in the United States is all, you know, low. But in this particular community, it's very, very low. And there is many reasons why it's low. There is a lot of refugees that arrive in San Diego that virtually have no flu shots whatsoever. And there is other people that believe that, you know, autism is causing, you know, the, 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 you know, the flu, uh, vaccine causing the autism. And there is many parents that are very hesitant to really uh, immunize their children because they believe that, you know, vaccine is harmful instead of helpful. So coming from that trust source and educating is very important. So for us, we have to be very flexible in terms of how we adopt, you know, how we build that trust, 
how we create our partnerships. Uh, we started with our partnership, uh, key partners that was part of it, but we added because we find out that we really need more expertise in you know, certain areas. So having that flexibility and adaptability, I think is very key. And the mentor and the support is not only pre-application, it's actually ongoing, as Dr. Hood mentioned. And so we're continuing to communicate with Alliance. And when we don't have that resource, they provide that resource. Thank you, Ahmed. Dwight, I think you might have had something to add. Well, uh, curveball, you better have a member on your team that can hit a curveball. I think when, <laughs> when you step up to the plate, you should be ready. If you're in the game, you got to be ready to hit the ball. So, you know, Alliance, we also pay a lot of attention to corporate governance. There's more than 11,000 nonprofits in San Diego County, and each one of those nonprofits need to have strong governance. They need to have uh, an understanding of how they operate. Um, you need to have a full team. Alliance tries not to interfere but guide. You know, you have to remain true to your mission, and as long as we can guide you to fulfill our joint missions, be no surprises, but you know, when you see that curveball, just bring up the right player to hit that ball. Well, and actually, just to, to make it a little real, Renato, how many different um, changes did you have to experience? I mean, first it was supposed to be at Hoover High, then, I mean, really, this, is, this isn't just you know, metaphors, right? This is Correct. four and a half years, and how many changes? Yeah, we've had, I would say, I think, uh, from, um, from Hoover High campus to place in City Heights to a couple other choices until we landed our own building with a partnership with the Jacobs. Um, I think it was those five complete different um, directions, completely different. And in some of them, we were two or three uh, weeks for, for receiving the location. Basically, the deal was done. Well, it's not done. Here comes the curveball again. Um, so that has happened often. It, it will probably happen to most of us. And so, and also, Ahmed, just real quick, and then I'm going to go to Dr. Hood. Uh, you know, you've been at this for about a year. And how many curveballs, like real curveballs, I'm thinking technology, change, partners, right? I mean, just, so just to be real without naming names, I mean, how many pivots have you had to already make? Uh, like I said, you know, we definitely seen that curveball right away. Uh, some of our technology partners, uh, we, you know, find out they, they're not the right, right technology partners, so we change that. I think we're the third technology partner right now <laughs> that we're going through, in part because, you know, our understanding of the project and scalability and sustainability and choosing that right partner that understands the community and can deliver that not only deliver but can stay, you know, that sustainability and scalability. So we definitely have that flexibility and that understanding, but definitely we have seen for the first year already some change in the technology space uh, and, the, and our partners. Thank you. Dr. Hood, I'm going to give you the last word. And uh, very uh, briefly, and I think uh, both of these uh, met this criteria, but with innovation, especially we're talking about a business model, I think everybody should really look at the leadership in the board. Is there somebody on your leadership and board that really understands uh, not just the not-for-profit world, but the, uh, uh, not just the for-profit world, but the not-for-profit world? Well, thank you. I want to just thank our panelists. This is the first panel. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing so openly. So I'd like to call to the stage Greg Angel, Julianne Howell, Don Jones, Natasha, and Jeffrey. Actually, I'd like to call Dwight Smith. He's going to fill in for Jeffrey, who unfortunately could not be here due to illness. OK, so we're going to kick off this panel, much like the last, where we're going to let our I2 winners tell us a little bit about their experience. And so I'll start with Greg. Greg, you want to kick us off? Tell us a little bit about Interfaith and the project. Uh, hi, everyone. Interfaith Community Services is a real broad-based social services agency. We're based out of North San Diego County, and we work a lot with people experiencing homelessness. Our project pitched a few years ago um, was to address a, a pretty big problem in a pretty simple way. We're, as a region, spending millions of dollars on the symptoms of homelessness in hospitals and jails and all sorts of other ways. 
And our theory was that if we could redirect those resources to actually address the underlying causes of homelessness, we could have better outcomes and theoretically sustainability. So um, what we pitched was kind of a super center um, or what we've taken to call the Betty Ford for people without Betty Ford money. Um, and so it's a place where anybody can go to detox, get residential treatment, outpatient treatment for people who are exiting hospitals for, uh, off of psychiatric holds or um, physical health conditions to be able to get housing, care, and support to address their health conditions and move forward in their lives. And the Alliance Healthcare Foundation support has helped bring that vision to reality. Thank you very much. Natasha, can you share a little bit about Multicultural Health Foundation? Good morning. I'm Natasha with the Multicultural Health Foundation. And we asked a very difficult question early last year, starting in January. If we have the technology and the programs, the partners, the insurances, the clinics, and the hospitals, and they're on the ground, and they're doing absolutely outstanding work, then why is the prediction of chronic disease in multicultural, immigrant, and refugee communities on the rise? Why is California stating that there's 1.2 pre-diabetics slated to become diabetics within the next four years? Why is amputation up 66% for diabetes in multi-ethnic communities? What are we missing? Not necessarily to start anything new, but what are we missing in terms of the work that's already on the ground? How can we strengthen it? How can we expand it? And how can we stop these predictions from happening? From that, we were blessed with the innovation grant from the Alliance Healthcare Foundation to start what we're calling the Prevention Alliance. It has one single focus, the economic empowerment of those individuals already on the ground that are providing prevention services, behavioral health services, around stopping and lowering chronic diseases in their communities. Our effort is to reach into the hardest to reach communities that typically are not in our rooms, Asians, Africans, Burmese, et cetera. Our effort is to let them know that we have their back, and we have their back by allowing them an opportunity to finally get compensated to grow and sustain the prevention work that they've been doing for many years, unfortunately, without compensation. And so our hope is to be able to use the National Diabetes Prevention Program as the beta test to do this magnificent work. We will be hiring individuals 18 years and older, health professionals, students, other individuals interested in being diabetes prevention coaches, and through our technology partnership, we will be able to access government and commercial reimbursement run money so that they can be compensated and we can sustain their work. Thank you, Natasha. And I'm gonna turn it over first to Don to say a little bit about your perception of these two innovations, why we invested and the like. So two things really, really important to me and I think our entire board that we're we're very clear with these two proposals. One is, you're not hearing the detail of the proposal. You're hearing a very high level description of what both of these uh, uh, organizations did. But we do actually delve into exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Uh, and when it's not logical, we ask questions. And in both cases, I think these two obviously passed the test uh, in terms of having the specifics and the logic behind what they plan to do. Now you've heard many, many stories here about how the original plan and what ultimately happens sometimes changes. We expect that. We actually expect that the plan that they end up with is not the plan they start with. But we want logic and we want a roadmap to judge against. These, these two provided us both of those uh, uh, situations in their, in their proposals and their interactions when they presented. The other thing that I think was very evident with these two was that we had leadership that was passionate about what they were gonna do, knew what they were talking about, and when we asked specific questions, had good answers. They actually sold their programs. They had 
I don't even know if you thought of yourself of having good sales skills, but you were outstanding. <laughs> you also did a phenomenal job of painting a picture about desperate services in San Diego that basically were discharging patients back to the street or, or clients back to the street and then they would just revert back to the old habits because they couldn't advance to the next stage. And you painted a picture that that could be that problem which was basically endemic across the United States could be fixed in your model and you had a passion for it and a story for it and you had actually lined up the partners including the sheriffs and the police departments etc that basically supported the effort both economically and, and uh, uh, operationally to make it work. And I think those, that level of planning was really, really key, key combined with passionate leadership, which basically said to us as a board, I think these people can actually make this vision work. Thank you, Don and Julie. So I'm a member of the program committee and when I look at proposals, I look at it from the perspective of how well does this program understand um, the issues that it's trying to ad address? What are the um, needs in the community, the gaps in the service offerings? Um, and so I'll speak first about Natasha's program because I still remember reading the proposal and thinking, wow, someone is finally taking advantage of what CMS is doing now with the um, diabetes prevention program. You know, CDC, I, I mean healthcare, you can tell is the terminology I'm using, but the Centers for Disease Control has known for a long time and supported REACH programs and so forth. But bottom line, you never get to sustainability until the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services decide that something is going to be paid for. CMS does not like the term reimbursement. I worked for CMS for six years, I can assure you that. It's payment. What are you doing? Can you cover the costs of it um, in a way that's sustainable? How do we facilitate that? And CMS has finally come to appreciate the social dimension of healthcare, not just medical care. So there is evolution now. And what Natasha's program, the Prevention Alliance, recognizes is we can finally pay people to do what's so essential and up to now has been supported only through grants. So that was what really excited me about that program. With Greg's program, similarly, I work for the county as a senior health policy advisor and am very much involved with the pilot that's um, bringing whole person wellness to the homeless population. So the kind of model that Greg has predates what we've been trying to do, um, but I've been familiar with, again, what we're lacking in the community and how you bring it all together. So again, that was a very exciting concept um, that I got fully behind because it just seemed to be filling a need that we have so much. Thank you very much. And Dwight, I'm gonna turn it to you now. Um, first, speaking about Greg's program, uh, the homeless issue is uh, present in front of us, something you cannot ignore. Uh, it's no fault to be homeless. You know, it's economic. It can be mental health. Uh, we have vets. We have incarcerated population. There's so many uh, bad things that can happen if you don't have a home base where you can receive treatment or referrals. So uh, I think Alliance looks at the homeless crisis as one of our key uh, health and wellness issues we like to address. I think Greg, um, his program had a real uh, novel approach. It was concrete. They had a plan to get people not only off the streets, but permanent housing with uh, the proper wraparound services that was, I think, what you need to get someone out of that crisis situation. Um, regarding N Natasha's program, uh, you know, diabetes, hypertension, these are things that should be you know, easily addressed, but for some reason we have not found a way to turn that tide. Her program demonstrated proven success of reducing all those critical health factors in a very cost-effective manner. Um, you know, it's not all about technology. I, I think their program was about the human touch, having social care workers go to the actual home. When you visit a person in their home, you learn so much more about what they need other than what a physician may get if you go to a clinic. You learn about their, their um, living style, what they have, what they don't have, the environmental factors, all those things I think are very important when you're trying to address uh, 
crises like diabetes, hypertension, and those matters. So that's why these two uh, candidates received my vote, and uh, they're doing a great job. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about the journey to sustainability. And I'm going to start with Greg, because you've been on the journey for a little longer than Natasha, since they are a new awardee and only in it for half a year. So maybe you could just talk about the journey, you know, sort of from the plan to where you are right now, including some of the, the changes along the way. Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. The concept is simple. We're, you know, wasting money on uh, in hospitals and law enforcement and other reactions to homelessness. So it makes sense that we could redirect those dollars to actually address and help people, right? But then executing that is, of course, you know, that's the challenge. So we had a broad plan as to how we were going to do it. And, uh, and you spoke a little bit to, you know, partnering with law enforcement to pay for some of it, looking at some models that, uh, to your point, were ahead of their time and didn't yet have funding streams lined up. So. The million dollars from the Alliance Healthcare Foundation basically gave us a big pot of money to begin to ramp the program up. Some of the components we were already doing. We already had a recuperative care program that was being paid for by hospitals to take people being discharged out of hospitals who were uh, without homes. We had a, a, a less evolved drug and alcohol treatment program that we began to um, expand and uh, in scope um, and, and in scale. The funding allowed us to do that and also begin to line up the, the revenue streams that ultimately would make it sustainable. And, and that's changed several times. It continues to change. Um, the, the latest development now is that we finally secured funding, um, really landmark funding through organized delivery systems of drug Medi-Cal administered by the county of San Diego, um, as well as funding from managed care organizations in addition to hospitals for the recuperative care piece. Um, and all of this means that we're now coming back to our initial model of a, of a super center, one location. And the challenge is, how do, we, how do we fully implement the wraparound services that we initially envisioned and pitched, while also realizing there are opportunities to actually already expand and replicate? And do we do that um, with ourselves in a leading role? Do we do that by coaching and supporting others? Do, you know, how, what does that look like? Um, and so that's been, uh, and, and that's kind of one of the, the challenges that we're, uh, that we're really fortunate to be working with today. Thank you very much. And can you just maybe say one more word about where are you on sustainability as of now? So the, the services as originally envisioned are now fully funded. Um, operationally. It uh, took a million dollars from Alliance Healthcare Foundation, and then we invested $700,000, the community did, of, of don inter interfaith donor money in addition to that. So it took us $1.7 million to get there, and we're now um, uh, sustainable for, um, for the next uh, five years. Thank you very much. Natasha, maybe tell us a little bit about your journey so far. I know that you have been at this for about a year-ish starting with the funding forum last year and then culminating with multicultural winning in July of 18. And now we're sort of a few months in. Maybe you could share the journey from your perspective so far. So my gray hair doesn't indicate <laughs> the journey at all. <laughs> um, but before I, respectfully, before I answer that, I would like to touch base momentarily on sustainability. For us, sustainability is at point A in the design process. And it also is more than money. I mean, a lot of times we think if we have a million dollars, and believe me, a million dollars over three years is not a lot of money, right? A lot of times we think if we have a million dollars, we have all this money, our work will be sustained. I encourage you to question that and think of other ways that your work can be sustained in your communities. So for example, we are actually looking at the ingenuity that exists in ethnic communities. And how do we take that ingenuity and possibly turn it into social enterprises or small businesses? For example, Dr. Susanna Flalo has a Healthier Me mobile app that allows people to track their weight, their blood pressure, email that to their doctors, receive recipes, and also receive invites to fitness events. This creates a larger social network around wellness. 
we are actually going to fund the ability for her to put her social app on every single pre-diabetic that comes through our program. And within three years, we are working towards 3,500 pre-diabetics finishing through the National Diabetes Program. That's a sustainability model. Urban Collaborative has this, organ this land close to Euclid Avenue called the, the Gathering Place. It literally is right across the street from apartment buildings that we already know house people with prediabetes, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. We are going to fund his ability to transform a storage unit into an opportunity to put a coffee cart, juices, storing pantry, so that those individuals can come right across the street and learn about health and wellness. So again, I encourage you, there are ways, other ways than money to look at how do we sustain the work that we do. Because at Multicultural, our hope is that even if Multicultural goes away, even if Dr. Hood and I retire, will the Prevention Alliance live? And it will live if we put the sustainability of that organization in the people that it's serving. It will do that. So again, I encourage you, look at many different ways to sustain your work. In terms of the process, this is a mindset change for nonprofit organizations. And we started out with a nonprofit hat on the impact that we wanted to do in the community. But what the Alliance Healthcare Foundation training and partnership has done for us is it helped us to understand that it's not about the structure, it's about the process and being open to changing your model re-looking at it, questioning it, throwing things out that don't necessarily work. Now, I promise you, this will require you to empty a closet at home, right? Someplace you can go in and scream, because it <laughs> gets rough, but it's worth it. It's worth it because you will know why you're doing this work. And through their process, step by step, inch by inch, they will help you to unveil the possibility of the work that you want to do. However painful. However painful <laughs> it is. Okay, I'm going to go back to the trustees for a moment <laughs> and ask actually um, to just reflect on the aspects of both of these, these innovations as you sort of cast sort of the future state and, you know, like what do we hope and what do we aspire and what are we dreaming about? not just what did we see, but also what are we aspiring and what do we see from these innovations that might be uh, at the scale of a home run or going home? You know, we talk about sustainability, but we also look for programs that can be replicated. Um, you know, nonprofits, they live day by day. Uh, it's hard to have cushions and you have to have cash flow. We, nonprofits are very appreciative of County money, federal money, it takes $2 to run a program, you may get $1 of federal or county support. So I, we know it's a difficult thing to have sustainability. But if we see a program that uh, has great promise, that can be replicated, um, and has great leadership, it will get our support. We believe the sustainability can come by working with the Alliance, you know, our board is very diverse. We have people in all phases of um, development, uh, people who have different skills and uh, abilities. So we believe sustainability is always a goal. We know it's not easy to achieve, but uh, you know, both of these uh, participants uh, indicated that. Thanks, Dwight. Don, I'm gonna pitch this to you. Well. You now have all figured out our secret. You've been invited to the Alliance Healthcare Foundation 12-step program for innovation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just add one comment, and that is while we don't require technology as an element of your proposal, I think it's something you should deeply consider, the technology elements that could impact your proposal and help it scale, help it become sustainable. One, one of the observations uh, I have in healthcare in general, and I've run healthcare organizations with over 100,000 employees, is that healthcare generally defaults to 
be an answer that says, when we have a problem, we'll throw more bodies at it. We'll hire more people. And what I think healthcare often fails to understand is when they hire a new employee, and let's just say that employee costs $50,000 a year fully loaded, that, that they're really making perhaps a half a million to a million dollar decision. They expect that person to be around for 10 or 20 years. So the real question you have to step back and go, if I'm going to spend half a million dollars or a million dollars, what else could I do? And I would just encourage you as you go through this process with us that you consider the technologies that might be available to help you answer that question. Julie. I'm going to bring in the policy piece um, because we're at, I think, a point of real um, inflection, if you will, within the payment side of healthcare, um, particularly in California, which is absolutely on the leading edge. So the recognition in Medi-Cal, for example, that unless there's housing, you cannot improve the health of somebody who's homeless. Um, Medi-Cal's beginning to inch up to figure out maybe some Medi-Cal dollars can go to actually pay for housing, not just for supportive services around housing. So being aware of the policy environment and what can change or what needs to change, because the other thing that Alliance is doing now is it is not just looking within its own resources. It is forming partnerships with other philanthropies it recognizes the importance of policy and how to play in that arena. And so our grantees can also help us to see the scope of what we need to do. Thank you, Julie. And just going back for a second, Natasha, and to touch on something that Don was also articulating, um, as it relates to the innovation that you brought forward, talk a little bit about the technology infrastructure that was already built that you could leverage because I think that's actually somewhat relevant, even if you're not building it yourself, the, the, the utility of that, maybe. So one thing that we learned when we talked to the community, because we did involve them in the design of the Prevention Alliance, they're also continuing as a part of the design with the hope that they will own it in the end, is what's stopping them from receiving the compensation from the insurance companies? And it is that claims and billing infrastructure that the insurance companies use. We actually researched to find the first manual around that. And it was 79 pages long. And I couldn't get past the, the table of contents. One of our board members who is involved in healthcare, he understood it much more than I did. And the end result was in a million years, small and medium nonprofit organizations on the ground will never have this infrastructure. So we are now leveraging a technology partner that has the claim and billing infrastructure for government as well as commercial insurance. And we will be able to pass all of our claims through that infrastructure. They will be the direct contact with the insurance companies. They will secure the money, return the money to the Prevention Alliance, and they, we will then return the money to the community. So having, sometimes we don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel on technology, especially when our expertise will never allow that. So a technology partner for us is absolutely critical. Thank you. Any final words? Does anybody want the last word? Going once. Greg. I'll just say, if you're thinking about a, a proposal, um, make sure, I would recommend it be something that you're, you're going to do either way. Like, we love Alliance Healthcare, but if they're not going to fund you, tough luck. Like, you're still going to do it. Because <laughs> the process is really time consuming. If you get to the finals, it, you're going to have to put in a lot of work. We tried once. We didn't get it. But the process was helpful in allowing us to actually go out and fundraise more effectively to continue to refine the model. And then once we got it, it still wasn't enough money. Uh, we still needed to go out and raise another $700,000 on top of the million. So um, I would just really encourage it be something that is going to happen either way, and this, this plugs into it well. Um, and then the other piece of it is um, we see the intersection of healthcare and social services or social determinants of health, we see those as in, inexorably linked. And I think the Alliance Healthcare Foundation gets that. And so if you're thinking about projects that can use um, that intersection to save funding and try to return that funding to fund the intervention, 
could be a, an interesting opportunity for, for you. And I'd like to add, I'm sorry, one quick thing. I recommend and I encourage you to go through this process. I don't know how many people in this room are tired of writing grants. I am, <laughs> right? Tired of our programs moving forward, stopping, moving forward, stopping for grants. I don't know about you. Multicultural said we're not going to do that anymore. This process helps you think differently in a wonderful way. And it, it is a domino effect, not just in your ideas and how you design, but in how you strategically create partners, how you strategically look at your financial model, how you strategically tell your story. It is a mind-blowing learning opportunity. I would strongly recommend to everybody, take advantage. It took us, this is our third time. It took us three times, but it's worth it. Thank you very much to our panelists. We very much appreciate it. Give them a round of applause. All right. Okay, without further ado, we're on panel three. All right, so I will ask James Bobo, Adama, Donald, Don Jones, John O'Hanian, and Joe to come back up to the stage, please. Thank you. All right, so much like in the prior panel, I wanna start with our I2 winners, and I'll ask John to kick us off. Okay, so my name is John O'Hanian. I'm the president and CEO of 211 San Diego and the Community Information Exchange. Um, we, we came along. Uh, we've been an organization that has existed as 211 here in San Diego for about 15 years, but came from a long line of social workers that were really looking at making it easier for organizations in our community. We have over 1,200 nonprofits representing 6,000 programs and services. So to know where to connect to each one, that mission started a long time ago. I came on board, and uh, am I going into the, the, the award as well in this? Yes, please. Part, part. <laughs> I didn't know if there was going to be a follow-up question, so preparation. Uh, we, we were fortunate to, to launch on to the, latch on to the uh, Project 25 that happened in our community. So I apologize. Uh, lots to fit in in a, in a short window. And where we showed that coordination work, the community leaders came together. And if Cami Christensen, if you can stand up real quick, is our senior vice president who actually wrote the application, hit the submit button, and uh, and we were awarded this this incredible opportunity to take two on one to the next level, to take our clients who we were giving out phone numbers to after engaging with them and wishing them best, to actually create more of a care management system community wide. We have so many great organizations in our community that help our clients, and we wanted to make sure that we were seeing the whole picture. When those clients came back to 211 through our doors, we were able to better coordinate, and more than ever, to create a tool that the community could use to better uh, improve the health of their clients. Thank you very much. Adama, you. can you share a little bit about your organization, and particularly the Text for Babies initiative? Hi, my name is Adama Dionysiak. I'm the executive director for Champions for Health, and what we do is we are the foundation of the medical society, and we get people healthy and keep people healthy. We provide pro bono specialty health care services to people who are uninsured through a network of volunteer doctors, physicians, nurses, hospitals, clinics, and et cetera, and we keep people healthy through our community wellness programs, which are immunizations, uh, speakers bureau, various kinds of screenings, uh, diabetes prevention program, and we couldn't do it without the multitude of volunteers that work with us and all of the various organizations that uh, give us those volunteers and work with us in a collaborative nature. Text for Baby um, came up in 2010. Um, before I was here, but it came up in 2010 and we were awarded $400,000 to create an app, Text for Baby, where health messages and appointment reminders could be given to mothers who were pregnant um, up to the first year of the baby's life. And um, I'll just stop for there and <laughs> I'm sure there'll be questions. Okay, great. So just now that we've sort of shared a little bit about those two programs, I'd like to ask our board and, and um, folks to just share a little bit about what we were thinking. And I'll start with Joe. Well, 
Well, I think Text for Babies was one of the uh, early projects we did, and it, it really hit the sweet spot in terms of technology and a need. And I think that the, the concept, it, it's like a lot of things. The concept is perfect, it's right on, it's logical, it's all a matter of timing. And when we went through with this initially, the timing was not quite perfect. And so this is where going through the developments, uh, working through the hard spots, uh, hitting the curveballs to maintain the metaphor became important. And everybody was patient, everyone hung in there and got through, so it, it ended up being a, a complete success. I think the problem with CIE was always timing, because that's always a problem, but I think it was more a, a problem of being homeless initially. The initial concept for CIE is one of those things that, of course it makes sense. As a physician, it made total sense to me. Uh, dealing with a patient who has social service needs, uh, but is not in a position to recognize them. I, you know, I, I can't recognize all the agencies I deal with and think of a, of, a, of a homeless person in the emergency room. And so the concept was perfect. And so everybody got on board with the concept, but how do you get from concept to reality? And the journey there was not so much a matter of timing as of finding the right path and finding a home. And it's, uh, John didn't describe the long story, but it's a long story in terms of how the organization eventually found a very capable home in CIE. And from my perspective, actually, uh, the, the visions of both CIE and 211 evolved in the process. Uh, very exciting, a very interesting journey, one well worth taking from my perspective. Thank you. Don. So both of these projects use technology to take people out of the system meaning they can operate and scale uh, without as many people. You can imagine that something as simple as making appointment reminders is off, most often done by staff picking up the phone, individually dialing phone calls, and then talking to people if they even reach them, as opposed to using text messaging, which is obviously fully adopted, just as one, one example. So that actually checked that box for us in terms of scale and, and, and costs. The same kinds of basic concepts regarding technology apply to the CIE equation. You all have situations where you could do things. You need to evaluate whether you should do those things. And then you come to us so you can do those things. But we want you to go through the could and the should analysis first. We see a lot of proposals, frankly, that are could proposals. I could do this, but they're not well thought out in terms of should. What we have stand here too is to help you can get over that hurdle to actually go forward. Thank you, Don. Jim. Well, I was fortunate enough to uh, be with the San Diego County Medical Society back in 2010 when uh, we got that award. So I'm looking at it from the other side. And you will reach a moment, at least we did, where we kind of looked at each other, Kitty and I, Kitty Bailey, and it was like one of those oh moments where, okay, we got it, and now how are we going to actually make this happen? So it's a wonderful thing to get the grant. It's also scary to get the grant, uh, because then you not only have to deliver, but you have to continue a relationship with Alliance Healthcare Foundation. I wasn't on the program committee back in 2010, so um, my, my text for baby is strictly from the receiving side. So that was one thing. The other thing about uh, the CIE is, is that back in the way before, it was an, a concept other than in Bud Beck's mind, and every uh, stakeholder meeting that I would go to, whether it was uh, Community Health uh, Improvement Partners, United Way, uh, 211, everyone that was in any of those meetings, if Bud Beck was there, you heard about his idea. And it was fascinating. Uh, the question, of course, was who's gonna fund it? and who's gonna be the backbone. And uh, so it was very exciting for me once I got on the program committee to have uh, the initial, with Scott, the initial funding and then to bring 211 on as uh, so a sustainable uh, model. And so that was a, a very exciting, again, to see two ideas in their very infancy, both of them uh, 
we're not necessarily guaranteed to be successful in, in any way, especially Text for Baby in its infancy uh, was, uh, I, 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 again, I wasn't on the committee, but there had to have been a lot of trepidation and worry that did we, did we actually throw money down a hole. Um, and uh, I, would, I would like to think that Text for Baby is probably one of our most successful, sustainable models that has been embraced maybe even nationwide, and, uh, uh, and we had the, the privilege of being a part of it a long time ago. Well, with that, I think I'm going to go to Adama first just to sort of follow that thread. Adama, maybe talk about the journey as you understood sure. it, mm -hmm. or you understand it now mm -hmm. that you've joined, mm -hmm. and sort of what you understand the twists and the turns might have been. So there's two populations to consider. There's the mom. And if you're working with uh, people who are at most risk for not receiving prenatal care and at most need for receiving health tips and making sure they go to prenatal care, there's that population. So what's important to them, right? Is it convenient? Is it free? How's it gonna help me? Why should I do it? Then you have the other population, the providers. Is it convenient? Well, I have to do something extra in the 10 minutes that I have with a client. Eh. Am I going to be reimbursed for it? We're not using that word, but am I going to be reimbursed for it? Nah, there's no CPT code. Ah. So, you know, what's going to turn ahead, trigger someone to use it? Uh, what's the incentive? And so that was some of the barriers. And texting at the time, you may not realize this now, but at the time, every text was charged. There was fees out the Yazoo to use it. It was brand new. Not everyone was doing it, blah, blah, blah. Now everyone does it, and it's nothing, right? It's second nature, and most of the time you don't have fees. So there was, you know, barriers in that sense, you know, how are you going to respond to the market need? How are you going to respond to a market need that the market doesn't realize it needs? Right? Two different questions. And so those were some of the challenges that I think uh, Jim was referring to uh, at, to move forward. Yes, there were collaborations. Yes, there were various providers that were involved, but the true success was when it became, and I don't like the word institutionalized, but it became integrated, nicer word, um, into a system. Because we always hear about system change, and I think nonprofits kind of throw your hands up like, uh, I need daily operations, I don't want systems change, <laughs> help me here, right? And so the system change isn't so much as we have to turn it on its head as to what can we integrate and how can we get people excited about doing that? So when the state of California Medi-Cal program mandated that as part of a well baby visit, people had to be automatically enrolled in text for baby, voila, there is the incentive all the way around. You're getting Medi-Cal, emergency Medi-Cal, as soon as you find out that you're pregnant, then you're on Medi-Cal, you have to go to these well baby visits, you get free appointment reminders, you get all of the various health tips and the provider works it into the conversation and they get reimbursed. So those, and, oh, most important, um, worked with the carriers to get rid of those, tech, uh, those text charges. So I think that the ultimate success was one million women at this point nationwide are part of this. It's part of, let me give you some numbers, 85 health plans, 20 health systems. There's a CMS grant for three and a half million in four states that have a larger Medicaid gap, like in California. And it's the largest model for mobile health. So now you might have heard of text for this, text for that. There's all kinds of text for health programs out there. It's sort of like, you mean you don't have an app for that? So, you know, we were part of the initial, I guess, innovation in health having to do with getting people healthier. Thank you, Adama. And just to sort of put a bow on that, I think from, a, from our perspective, it was, you know, better, higher quality, less costly, and widening the aperture of access. So just to sort of hit on those themes. John, maybe talk a little bit about your journey, and then we'll come back to our trustees. Sure, and it's incredible to us that it's taken, you know, we've been on this journey for about eight years and to see how, it, how it's come about and different iterations. And there were a couple notes that I took during some of the, the talks earlier today that the, the first part that I heard was the three pieces are innovation, collaboration, or coordina coordination. I didn't catch the C word, did anyone? Was it coordination or collaboration? Anyone coordination. remember? Coordination. Okay, and trust. And I think when we think about our journey, you know, that, that piece of trust 
I think came from the years of our predecessors and people before us that earned the trust of us trying to provide a high quality service at two on one to the public so that when we came up with a new idea or a new way to do things with our partners over the years, whether it was deepening our relationship in the veteran community, deepening our connection in the, in the homeless uh, provider community, uh, each one of these provided an opportunity for us to work with a series of partners. We never do anything alone. It's all about how we engage our partners. We're able to learn along the way, build trust, and show them as a place that we're trying to be support for them. Uh, we're trying to add capacity. We're trying to improve efficiency. And so I think that piece uh, came together. It ties well with our coordination with them. And then, hey, we have an innovative idea, which, by the way, wasn't our idea, but it was something that was happening that we thought we could participate in as well. Uh, I think what's been interesting is uh, what we realized early and what I shout out to you as you think about, you know, the number one uh, project idea is sustainability because the idea is great of what you're going to be able to do, but if you can't sustain it, I think one of the, the heartbreaking things for me is one of the CIEs, first CIE that I knew about in the country was in Austin, Texas. We went and visited them and it was phenomenal. And then I found out that 18 months after I left, they had to close it down because they didn't have the funds. And you know, us being a part of this I2 and then being part of the invest up strategy and having a funder that's willing to be there while you're taking that risk. And that's, you know, when we go out throughout the country and hear about CIEs that are trying to get off the ground, they really need that, that push. So for all of you, it comes back to value. For us, it comes back to value. Who, who are we valuing in the community? Is it our health plans? Is it our health system? Is it our county? Is it our cities? Is it the organizations we work with? And what value so that whatever dollar amount we put on your participation in CIE, it's a no-brainer. It's a 10 to 1. It's a 100 to 1 shot. And I think that we're seeing more and more that it's there. And while we're operating the CIE, we're very proud. We have 52 network partners. We have over 75,000 clients that have consented to share their information with these 52 trust network partners. That's huge. That's trust on the nonprofit side that, that we can work together with our, with our organizations to understand what that means and learn about privacy and security. And we learned a lot. One of our board members, Dan Chavez, is here from San Diego Health Connect. They have years and experience. Uh, in this world, how do we leverage that piece and work together as we approach the health communities as well? So that trust factor there, as well as the clients. Thanks. I'm going to turn it now to Don. So both of these examples grew from something that comes out of the telecommunications industry called network effect. Network effect grows when others sell your services for you. You all know about network effect because you all have cell phones and you know that there's value in being able to contact anybody else in this room, whether it be by text or call or, or otherwise. Both of these organizations built networks. They serve networks, they built networks, and now their other network partners sell their services for them. They're not the only one out there evangelizing about what they do. John, you have 75,000 enrollees that are getting a benefit and a value and perhaps telling others what they're getting. And you have 52 partner organizations that are telling each other what the value is. And so they're building the network and telling other partners that they should join as a result. That's what one of the characteristics that we really highly value when we look at a proposal. Are you going to create network effect? So here's two great examples that, that have done just that. Joe? So I want to take a, another page from Don's book and talk about the plan coming in and having that solid. I'll underline that as being very important. The other part that we look at, though, coming in is leadership. Uh, because the people are as important as the plan. And that's not to say the plan isn't important, it's that the people are critical. Uh, one of the things that we would like you to do is to con convince us that not only do you have a solid plan, but that you have the people, the team, that can make it work. That's important because the other thing you've heard is that almost inevitably with our projects, what we end up doing is not what the initial proposal was. There's a lot of evolution there. So, uh, what was it, uh, Mike Tyson, uh, your, 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 your battle plan has ended after the first punch. And sometimes the first punch comes before the first check's written. So, have a good team with your good idea. Uh, we want the idea to work. And most, 
we, we have a pretty high hit rate if you, if you think about this kind of investing. And that's because of the after award partnership and the willingness to go through different iterations of the initial plan and the team to make it happen. Thank you. Jim, anything else you want to say on this front? Uh, just real quick. Um, the one thing that really strikes me, especially about uh, CIE and uh, some of the other speakers mentioned it uh, a little earlier this morning, is that it's not just over once you get the money. And it's not just over once you've been promised the money. And it's not just over after you've gotten all the money. As a matter of fact, as it was alluded to, some of the folks who have been receiving a grant from us for the million dollars have come back to us in the form of, is there a loan maybe that is in, in place that can help us even take it even farther? So I think um, it's a long-term relationship that you uh, get involved with that can be far larger than the million dollars if you're fortunate to get that. And the last thing I want to say, and, and you mentioned Dan, and I asked Dan if it's okay, but the uh, Health Information Exchange in a few days is going to have a, a, an interface with the Health Information Exchange with the CIE. And to me, that is, that's huge. Um, and uh, I think within two weeks or something like that. So anyway, um, and, and Dan said it was okay to mention it. So um, uh, anyway. Well, it's not news to me, but it's news that it's public. So uh, hey, there you go. But I think it speaks to trust. I mean, think about someone, think about your health information. Think about things that are happening in your lives, in your family's lives, and then you think about the social service side of things. There is, I don't think that we can uh, overstate how, how critical it is to the people that are calling in, and I know because you all work with, our, with, with clients as well, is that story, that individual, that struggle that's going on, and now we're gonna have not just us, right? I mean, we, we run an organization, we look at our own team and our own training and our own service delivery, and we take that very seriously because we're working with people that have a lot of needs. And now we're working as a team. In some ways, people we don't know, but it comes from that trust. But I think the best part about it is we all know that it's going to take all of us to help advance that individual to where they need to go. And so uh, when I, one of the comments that was made earlier, it's, it's that coming back side that is going to strengthen. Even if you don't win the, the grand prize, I guarantee you that your idea will have a lot more legs, a lot more ideas. There's a lot of connections that, that can be made. So be bold in your request, because like they said, it's change it, it can change. Tell them what you really think. Tell them what you really think it's gonna cost. Throw it out there, because I think that's, that's a way to get the conversation going. That's actually a really good point, and I think just worth repeating again that while we aim, this is a million dollars a year, if the project is a five million or a six million or a three million or an 800,000, say what it is, what you think it is. And that number should be the number to get to sustainability. And then I'm gonna come back to sustainability in a second, which to us is just earned revenue that floats the boat, right? It just makes the entity work. Adama, talk to me a little bit about the sustainability, just because I think it's, it's worth sort of, this was an early investment I think you weren't there at the time, but Jim, you were there at the time, and maybe just, just speak to that journey. So, it's a rocky boat, <laughs> from my understanding. Um, so you have partners, and you have tech partners, or we had tech partners, Voxiva, which then changed to Sense Health, which then changed to WellPass. So, you know, the curve balls, if you will, curve nuggets. Anyway, and so the uh, for-profit is your partner, is working with you in whatever sense. But if your business plan gets ahead of you, isn't right beside you, you don't, you don't embrace it as you should, then sustainability is, it's here. You know, Text for Baby is out there. I just looked it up, you know, this past week. Very vibrant, very robust, all the different kinds of um, features on it, uh, the different partners are involved, the tons of research that have come out of it and everything. But we don't own it. The for-profit owns it. And they took it national, and it's through that. We can, by extension, say we started it, 
we were the mom <laughs> for text for baby, but the community, right? It takes a community to raise a baby. So the community <laughs> took it on, if you will, the for-profit community, and it's sustainable in that sense. So what does sustainable mean? What does it look like? That, you really have to consider what that is, where the earned revenue will come from. And as a nonprofit, I think generally, we haven't really talked about it. Yeah, social enterprise, it's sort of there, we sort of think about it, but maybe we don't put as much emphasis on it as we could. So I think that that's one of the lessons for Champions for Health, you know, the foundation in the past, that it, you really have to keep an eye on the ball, your eye on the ball, uh, to see, <laughs> you know, where are things taking it so it's not out of your hands. Thank you very much, Adama. And I'd like to thank our panelists. Give them a round of applause. Okay, so now we're at the point of our journey here where we're going to be, we've got our, our last speaker to take us home. So Ricardo de Santos, he's your I2 journey guide. He's also an entrepreneur in residence at ResMed Strategy and Ventures Arm. At ResMed, Ricardo manages the company's novel ventures incubator, combining elements of internal and external entrepreneurship and venture capital. He is focused on creating purpose-driven digital health ventures and partnerships at the world's most connected med tech company, innovating like and with startups. Ricardo was previously the chief business officer for Biological Dynamics, an oncology diagnostic startup. Ricardo helped lead the company from inception to its commercial stage while successfully securing multiple rounds of funding. Before Biodin, Ricardo helped set the standard for successful corporate entrepreneurship at Qualcomm. Where, while there, he created an internal innovation competition and corporate accelerator that turned out dozens of successful projects and leaders. As your I2 journey guide, Ricardo will certainly be an asset to our I2 applicants. Please help me welcome Ricardo to the stage. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to see that everyone's still here. It's been a long morning. So that must mean one thing. You want to know how to win a million dollars, right? It's not that you want to hear my spiel. So should I tell you how? All right. Um, just quickly about me, I wear two hats nowadays, so in my day job I am the entrepreneur in residence um, at ResMed where my colleagues and I help come up with health and wellness solutions that are better, cheaper, and when we're lucky, actually usable by human beings. That's it's always the hard part. Um, and in my nighttime, I prowl around in the AHF and working with Elizabeth and the gang on designing the best possible I2 program for 2019. Um, specifically, my role is to be your tour guide through this exciting journey. So, Elizabeth and I wanted to brainstorm quickly on how, what picture could we put up there that would tell a thousand words as far as what this journey would be like. And that, you know, Elizabeth was just wanted to make sure that I showed something that was a little bit challenging but not too hard, you know, we don't want to scare everybody away the first day, so. You know, I thought this kind of thing would be appropriate. <laughs> Walking on a high wire, a thousand feet in the sky. Uh, let me take a pause and talk about this gentleman. Anybody know who this is? It's, it's not Don Jones when he was younger. Who is this? Philippe, Philippe Petit, okay? So on a nice day in 1974, at the ripe age of 24 years old, Philippe Petit decided to walk, decided to string a wire between the, the World Trade Center towers and walk across. Not once, not twice, but eight times. Not for a minute or two, and whew, get it over with, but 45 minutes. He walked, he pirouetted around, he sat, he laid down completely flat on that wire a thousand feet in the sky. So, why, why did this person do this, you may ask? Why did he do this? Why would somebody do this? Was he 
Was he crazy or desperate? Meaning, was he taking on excessive risk that didn't need to be taken? It's a possibility. I got it. He had a death wish, right? He had a death wish, so he, he would do something like this. Actually, Philippe was very upset when people thought he had a death wish. Philippe had a life wish. Philippe had a mission. His mission was to inspire people to figuratively fly in whatever field of their choosing. He did this by almost literally flying himself across the sky. Philippe was a magician. Philippe was a modern day Icarus. Is a modern day Icarus. He's still alive. He still walks across high wires three hours a day. But in doing this type of journey, what can we learn from Philippe? What is the secret to doing the seemingly impossible? Philippe was trying to tell us that it is when we face the seemingly impossible that that is when we find our greatest passion. So what is the secret to being able to go on such a journey of life of your choosing? It really comes down to one word and one thing only, and that's the beauty of it. That word is practice. Philippe didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I think I'm just gonna climb up there, string a wire across, and walk it over with a big stick, see how it goes. He practiced for six years. So by the time this day came, people thought, are you afraid of the risk, afraid of dying? He goes, yes, I am terrified of dying. If I die, I can't continue to do this. I have practiced to the point where I'm 100% confident that this will go well. So much that I'll spend 45 minutes up there. So what we're trying to do here with you guys is to provide you, at the end of the day, what we do is to provide you with a practice environment for social entrepreneurship. The best possible practice environment in the world for social entrepreneurship. An environment where it's okay to make mistakes without grave consequences. And we've strung together, no pun intended, the three key ingredients that it takes for humans to make progress. Number one ingredient, dreamers. Number two ingredient, incentives. Number three ingredient, you might not like this one, but it's fair competition. Yes. We will get at least 100, 100 or so of you to begin this walk on the high wire of social entrepreneurship with us. We'll blow some strong winds, and we'll get down to five or seven. However, remember what I said, it's a practice environment. We got you covered. All of you going through this program will be benefiting from our support system, our world-class support system that Elizabeth and team have put together. And that is training, that is mentorship, and that is hands-on services to help you get better at what you do. So that achieving a million dollar prize, whether it's this one or another one, will be the impossible dream that you will achieve. Let me double click here, actually triple click on the training since that's the part I'm mostly responsible for. Number one, we offer training in every phase of the program. That is an innovation for this year. Number two, uh, we will cover substantive advice related to social entrepreneurship and the world of healthcare. We will talk about tools for the social entrepreneurship, and we will continuously talk about this philosophy that you've heard throughout the day through every single speaker, which is that at the end of the day, you're seeking the truth. And to seek the truth, you need to remain curious and you need to remain flexible. One of the things that we'll teach you in the spirit of remaining curious and flexible is to start working from a blank canvas as far as putting together your winning pitch. The beauty of it though is that this comes down to a tried and proven formula of four chapters on how to sell something to anybody. That is an opening where you lay out your intentions, 
the credibility, the trust. That is the second chapter where you uncover the need and uncover that gap in humanity that needs to be filled so that you untap the passion in your funding uh, targets as well. The next chapter where you lay out, where you demonstrate, where you can fill that need, A, and B, that you can continue to fill that need. You can build a sustainable model to keep the good going. Then finally, a closing argument that motivates people to embark on the journey with you. Yes, and of course, to give you some money. The key date, number one, uh, we, we are uh, requesting a simple submission of your idea to come in by February 15th. I'm sure all of you have what it takes already in your heads, in your, in your current work to get that done. And reminder that the finale to get the million dollars is on July 19th. So don't go anywhere during those dates. I'll leave you with another, another quote from Philippe that at the end of the day, he's saying that the most important part to a journey is to take the first step. And then if you practice, it, it'll become second nature. That you will, you will develop momentum to go towards your dream and no one can stop you. So I was gonna do a mic drop, but we only have like four or five, I won't. But thank you very much for your time and please hang around for Q&A. Um, we'll just quickly do this live poll, and let's see here. So for those of you who had this earlier, get your phones out. And just a reminder, you're texting to 22333. Everybody good? Going once, going twice. Put your hand up if you need a minute. Okay, sold. All right, so um, when you think about what you heard, what are you hearing in terms of what's essential for an I2 project? So just take a moment, and for those that are submitting, I'll ask just those that are submitting so that we don't max out our poll, okay? Great, systems change, absolutely. Great, so you get, you get it, technology is an enabler. It's really about changing the system, making things appreciably better. Great. All right, so another quick poll. Just thinking about, you know, this morning, sort of what do you think so far? Okay, we'll give it a moment. Okay, great. So now we just want to open it up for any lingering questions and answers that you might have. So, I think I see some hands, and we have some mic runners. Uh, Brian, I see somebody right here. Um, I think I saw another hand. So if you put your hand up if you want to ask a question, we've Elizabeth. got mics. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Right here. Yes. Hi, I'm Jill Seneca. I'm with Noah Homes in Spring Valley. Uh, my question is, where is it on the website now, the posting of the application, the procedures, you know, the technical things of our yes. next steps? So the answer is yes. On our website, you have the application. And as Ricardo mentioned, it's a simple application. So it's really designed to be filled out in not very long, actually. I, I, we're, we're looking just for the idea at this point. Next question, Karen. Just a quick question. You gave some dates before. Could you repeat those dates and what's due each of those dates? I know the idea is due in February. But. So the entire calendar is on our website. Okay. So um, please feel free to visit our website. But the, the two dates that Ricardo mentioned is, and this is the really important one, let's just start with the first one. February 15 is the submission date. So you got to get it in by what? Is it midnight on the 15th, Brian? Midnight on the 15th. All right, and then we have, Alliance will make our decision on January 19, where we have our pitch fest. And for those of you who are starting the process, you will want to make sure that you would hold your calendar. And we'll, we'll provide an entire calendar for the various workshops as well. That will, that will all be on our website. Other questions? 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Raghu Ayer. I am from uh, NextCube, which is an uh, incubator accelerator. Ricardo, I know very well too, but you know, I really wanted to, I spent a lot of time in New York and Silicon Valley, but you know, uh, Elizabeth, I definitely wanted to, you know, really appreciate this phenomenal platform that you've created, you know, bringing wonderful panels and, you know, I think to have, you know, Robin give the keynote and to top it off with Ricardo, you know, is, is phenomenal. And bringing this ecosystem, you know, where you bring, you know, social, you know, entrepreneurs, the social organizations and, you know, uh, everything else that makes it work is phenomenal, you know. Uh, and we'd love to get involved in whatever way we can. Again, awesome work. Thank you very much. And good thought, thought leadership, you know, and best practices as well. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Do I see any other hands? So I want to just invite everyone to a closing reception. We really appreciate you being with us. Please see me, see any member of our staff. If you have any questions, I'm happy we'll be around. So look forward to it. Thank you all.